Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this IRM webinar. Uh, on the 31st of December this year, the UK will stop following the EU trading rules. And what happens next depends on talks that are at this moment at a critical point. Will the UK crash out or will an agreement be reached? Either way, there's work to do. We need to adapt to the new arrangements. As risk professionals, we're accustomed to dealing with uncertainty, and this, on top of everything else that happens this year, is testing our skills to the max. So, welcome to this webinar, and first, some technical points. Um, I'm afraid if you have problems with the sound or the video, um, it's probably due to uh, bandwidth issues somewhere on the internet that are um, stopping you picking things up, and there's nothing that we can do at this end to make it any better. But the good news is that this webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to tune in and run it again uh, if you've missed anything. Uh, if you have any questions as we go through, then please type them into the box and we will have a question session at the end and we can pick up your questions at that point. Um, I'd also like to remind you in the um, uh, invitation, you will have seen that there was, a uh, for people who completed the survey, um, there is a, a very kind offer from our panellists here um, to provide a, a prize for one of you and that is um, two hours consultancy and a full look at the um, uh, data system behind the what, what they're going to present today um, and we're going to pick somebody at random um, to um, as, as the prize for completing. Um, we're going to keep the survey open because it builds up really useful data for everybody and that will be open until next Wednesday, and then we will um, pick our, our prize winner at random after that. So, um, our agenda this afternoon, um, we have four speakers today. I'm just gonna share my screen so that we can see the agenda. So, let's have a look, here we go. Hello. Okay, here we go. Right. So, yes, our agenda. We have four speakers and then we have a question session. Um, each speaker has 10 minutes to speak and so they've asked me to give them a warning uh, after eight minutes and uh, we will cut them off. So hopefully um, they'll be able to get everything that they want to say out in 10 minutes. Um, we're going to finish at, um, well, five past five, five fifteen at the very latest and uh, um, then <clears throat> you, so you'll be able to catch up and um, watch the recording if you miss anything or forward on the recording indeed to any to anybody who you think should have um, should have uh, attended this okay so i'm first going to hand over um to um dr ray nolte uh, ray is president of both brexit partners and stratagem partners um, previously, he's held international and global leadership roles with various consulting firms, including PwC, PA Consulting Group, IBM, Navigant Consulting, Barclay Research Group. He specializes in corporate strategy, innovation and disruption, and he's been awarded se separate doctorates in scenario planning and technology enabled change. And he's been involved in over 100 Brexit projects to date. And his clients have included national governments, industry associations, state agencies, public and private companies. So uh, we're very privileged to have you with us today, Ray, and to hear what you're going to say to us about the actual state of play. Now, I'm just going to switch the, um, the handover as a presenter to Ray so that he can control his own slides. So here we go. Right, Ray, let's see what you've got to show us. Can you see my screen? No, Not I would yet. show my screen now. Here we go. Does that okay. work? Yes. Great. Um, okay. So thank you, uh, Carolyn, and uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, speak at this event. Um, we've been providing advice and Brexit for nearly four years now, and it's hard to believe that there's only about 21 days to go, yes. obviously less than 21 days. Mm -hmm. um, the reason is not that we're looking forward to it, uh, far from it. Uh, I think the reason it's hard to believe it's 21 days to go is because there's such significant implications. There's been relatively poor preparation for us, and there's a lot of unknowns that are going to happen. 
So it's a, with a bit of trepidation, a bit of excitement, and also we're wondering to see how people are going to take opportunities from it. When we started preparing for Brexit, we basically saw it in four phases. The first one was looking at the economic implications for countries and industry sectors. We were looking at things like GDP, balance of trade, market performance, and valuations. In the second phase, we were looking at strategic issues for industries and corporations. For example, what's the future of the City of London? How is it impacted by Brexit? Um, where should we be moving a company's headquarters to for regulatory reasons? Uh, where should manufacturing organizations be planning to uh, invest in the future? Uh, which location, uh, which government uh, would give them best value for it? And also going concerns about suppliers and customers. And the next phase, we were beginning to be asked about public policy and political considerations. And you know, does the government really support the sector? For example, I remember being in Canary Wharf with a, a global CEO of a major bank, and his view was that the UK government didn't care about financial services, and why should he locate his bank in the UK anymore? And you know, his reasons for moving to uh, Frankfurt and to Dublin. Um, and then there was, I remember working with a pharmaceutical company who hadn't realized the uh, positive public policy plans of the UK government, uh, particularly around uh, life sciences and their investment plans, which basically told them that they should be investing more in the UK and there's a lot of opportunities for R&D. And then laterally, in the run-up to the, the last deadline, it was around operating model readiness. It was about you know relocating, relocating the business, making sure the technology changes and process changes were in place and also making sure uh, suppliers are ready and it seems to me for a lot of the clients we're back at the stage of you know those four stages but we're doing them all together uh, because clients haven't addressed them and in some cases because things have changed quite dramatically and both from a regulatory point of view and a business environment point of view they're actually having to revisit things that they've already done before so the fact that they prepared previously actually doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready for the next phase. So from a political point of view, um, you probably are all pretty clear about what's happening. But we have to remember that despite the promises to deliver trade deals, apart from Japan, UK has delivered no trade deals. And it's unlikely to be able to, to deliver the trade deals that it wants uh, even next year or by the year after. These trade deals take a long time to put in place. And in fact, nothing has really changed from a negotiation point of view over the last six months. The core issues are still the same issues, fisheries, level playing field, governance, uh, and there's still major differences between each of those. Um, the Biden presidency probably put more pressure on the UK in terms of the Northern Ireland protocol and the likelihood of a US-UK trade deal, because if they didn't follow what was previously agreed, um, then there was no chance of a, of a US trade deal. But even at that, that's going to be a long trade deal to negotiate. Both the EU and the UK um, want a deal, but not at any cost. And we can't underestimate the pressure on both sides not to concede. And there are big pressures, for example, on the UK government, not only politically, and that was the promise of the of Conservative Party in getting elected, but also in terms of the future of the union. You know, what's the, what's the implications for uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland and, and Wales uh, continuing to want to be part of the Union. Or indeed, on the EU side in terms of the budgetary contribution which uh, Britain made and is having major implications at the moment on the budgetary discussions uh, within the European Union. So under political pressure, the EU this morning issued its contingency plans um, in four broad areas, you know, air connectivity, aviation safety, basic road connectivity, and fisheries. And forgive the pun, there is a catch. And, you know, the, U the European Union will not um, allow these unless they have access to UK waters. Um, so don't hold your breath for a deal on Sunday. This probably will go to the wire on the 31st of December and even beyond. I do believe that there will be a deal. In fact, I don't believe there's anything such thing as a no deal because governments, the EU and the UK government will try and normalize the situation or make the best out of it with some form of agreement, but that could take time uh, to implement. I think the other thing, even if there was a deal in the run up to the 31st, ratification of that may not be possible until January or even later. Um, so potentially we could have a situation where we have you know, a no deal situation 
followed by a deal situation. And, you know, it's all about timing. From a um, strategic economic issue, um, I'm looking at two forecasts from UK sor government sources. The first one was from the Bank of England um, last year, where they'd estimated that the impact of a no deal uh, would be minus 9.3% on the UK economy. Um, and it would result in an average reduction of 238 billion per annum uh, over a 15 year period. 7.4% uh, drop in real disposable income. And then more recently, the uh, Office for Budgetary Responsibility estimated the long-term effect of a deal on GDP, this is back in March of this year, as 4%, in fact, uh, larger than the impact of COVID. So, you know, if you add COVID on top of uh, uh, a deal, or indeed COVID on top of a no deal, um, there's pretty significant uh, implications for uh, the UK economy. Um, the uh, UK government's uh, National Audit Office has um, prepared an assessment of government preparation on, on Brexit. And what I've done is I've just lifted bits from their report uh, onto this slide. And um, you can read these at your, at your leisure. I'm sure these slides will be passed on to people. But essentially what they're saying is that due to complexity and the scale of Brexit, and the impacts of COVID on the UK government and public infrastructure, um, we're not ready. Uh, and in fact, we probably won't be fully ready or we won't be able to protect the UK on the impacts for years to come. Um, operating processes, systems, customs, procedures, staffing, and so on aren't in place. But there's going to be major delays at airports, ports, roads leading to airports. We all know about that. We know that contingency plans haven't been fully tested. We know that the Northern Irish Protocol has huge elements of complexity and, you know, things probably won't be in full working order for six months at best, could be a year. We don't know because contingency plans, as we've said, haven't been tested. When we begin to look at it from a business point of view, uh, we're actually very concerned about business readiness. Uh, survey results indicate that about 75% of British firms uh, aren't ready yet. And uh, surveys that we've undertaken ourselves would indicate that about 37% of firms don't plan to start anything. That's no preparations have been done so far until they know the outcome of political negotiations. And this points out, at this point out that firms really don't know the difference between a deal and no deal. It's actually wafer thin. And you know, a deal, all it covers is um, basic trade, uh, covers uh, uh, covers how systems will integrate between the governments. And what we're seeing is that the lack of readiness is hampering many suppliers and customers' preparation. There's been little commercial engagement. You know, um, stockpiles haven't been built up like they've been built up before, probably because of COVID. And we're seeing that about 80% of UK retailers, 60% of service firms, are reporting significant cash flows. So um, what should you be concerned about for your first uh, two, uh, 100 days of 2021? You know, do we really understand our customers' requirements? What's the impact on customer profitability? Can we deliver uh, goods on time? Can we deliver them freshly? Uh, do we understand uh, the contractual implications and how we mitigate them? We're getting a lot of questions here about you know, if we're going to suffer losses, I'm can we walk away? Do we have sufficient capacity? and have we applied the necessary easements available? So uh, you can read many of these slides yourself, and um, there's some quotes here and disclosures, which basically point out examples of where major firms have pointed out major strategic issues in their annual reports, and you will have to do the same. And I would say the lessons from Brexit are, you really need to understand public policy and political issues. They are big risks. And the, de the devil here is in the deep detail. And whilst there are a lot of opportunities from Brexit, you are in danger of ecosystem contagion and risk. And the fact that you're prepared for Brexit, but public infrastructure isn't, and your suppliers or customers aren't, that's going to affect you just like COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Okay, right. I'm now going to change presenter, and I'm going to change to John Shuttleworth. Okay. So while John is sorting out his, his slides, um, I'd introduce John. 
Um, John is an authority on setting strategy, executing strategy and change management. And uh, his experience spans finance, commerce, government bodies around the globe. His style is that of coach to management teams, preparing and equipping them to plan and execute strategy and to deliver challenging goals. So, right, John, we, ah, we've, this is all working. We have your, your presentation here. Thank you very much. Yep. So, right, Thank you, I'm Caroline. Gonna, okay, so you're on the clock as well. So I will I'm give you a clock. warning at eight minutes. Here we go. So off you go. Um, uh, thank you, Caroline. Thank you to everybody who's who's logged in. Uh, we're not going to get into detail. What I'm hoping to do in the next 10 minutes is a fairly high level scan around uh, what, what we see uh, in terms of government guidance for companies. Um, and uh, what that may enable you to do is to spot areas where you need to do a deeper dive. And there's lots more material coming up in, uh, in the distribution sets or if, if there are areas that you'd like to explore, then please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. All that adds to the greater good uh, of, 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 of the community generally. So on the, on, the, on the chart, let's just understand where we are. On the left, full EU membership, moving away to EEA, to some bilateral agreements, leaving the, that's uh, staying out of the European Union politically, but in both the single market and the customs union. And that takes you as far as the, the Turkish option, who are in the customs union, but not the, not the single market. Uh, the next move to the right um, is that you're out of the single market and in the customs union. And the, the significance of that must not be lost. If we say, where were we under Theresa May at the point where we did the Withdrawal Act in the UK, which was rolled into a European withdrawal treaty, which included the, the 500 page protocol, which I did read, uh, and, uh, and, and set the scene for Northern Ireland, that put a massive stake in the ground at that point of leaving the single market, but remaining in the customs union. What happened next was in 2019, we had a general election. And the stake in the ground was kept there by the European Union, including Northern Ireland, but moved for the, for the rest of Great Britain by the Conservative government when, with their 80-seater majority. And what that meant from there on in, we left the EU politically on the 31st of January this year, and the scope for the deal was fairly small. And if we got to the end of the year, then we would leave with no deal. That's what Ray means by wafer thin. Think of this in terms of risk, the misunderstanding amongst the public and a lot of business is huge. So where are we? Deal or no deal, the transition period whereby we'd left politically but remained for 12 months in the single market and customs union, that finishes at 2300 GMT, on Thursday the 31st of December. Exactly as the bells strike midnight in Brussels, the UK leaves. And that has an impact on everything to do with goods, services, capital and people. What I'm going to do now, from given that uh, we're, we're talking about risk, is a very quick skim around those four and just to have a look at some of the complexities that are arriving as a result of the, the decision, particularly that decision that we were leaving the, 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 sing, the single market and the customs union. So 2000 civil servants, two years in the writing. Uh, in October 2020, they released a 278 page explanatory booklet on what was going to happen, deal or no deal. This is the systems map on the right, just uh, to give you a, an idea of the complexity of how those systems have to work together from 2300 in 21 days time. Uh, depending on the nature of your goods, if you're moving them by road, there are 29 different flows that you have to understand and follow uh, for, for road imports. There are 28 flows, different flows, different systems, different reporting, if you're moving exporting goods by road to the EU. There are a whole set of flows for air transport, goods moving by air transport. There are flows for rail transport, separate again and there are flows for goods moving by pipelines electricity and gas primarily 
So all of those are different, new, and have to be gotten right. From a risk perspective, the National Audit Office on the 6th of November published a traffic lights for, and I, I, I've drawn, drawn this up from, from their document. Um, this shows the IT systems, all of which have to work together seamlessly from, the, from, from 11 o'clock on the 31st of December. And the frightening thing from a, a project or risk perspective is how many of these systems are brand new. So I've just highlighted some of the new ones. Uh, they also have to work with a whole new set of infrastructure, documentations and certification checks for animals and plants. There are resource, resources and roles. Um, not everybody has been recruited and as of the, right now the government is looking to outsource some of these critical border roles from the end of the month. And there's a lot of different players, all of whom have got to work seamlessly together. I didn't put the European Union in, in there as a player and I probably should as well. Never mind the detail, just think of that from a risk perspective and make sure that, that, that uh, if your organisation is any way moving goods that you are on top of this. Goods. From the 1st of September it was announced that we would no longer accept the CE mark uh, on products in the UK. Um, so CE marks if good, technically, if goods have aren't on UK soil on the 1st of January, you're not allowed to sell them. Technically, um, I can't see how it's going to be policed. 150,000 businesses presently are registered and issue CE marks, and it uh, has to be put on the product. If you can't get it on the product, you put it on the packaging. Uh, so from the 1st of January, the old British Standards Institute, they're not doing the kite mark, but you get used to this one. UKCA is the mark that has to be put on all products presently carrying the CE mark. Uh, and they've increased the scope of products whilst they were about it. So aerosols not currently covered by CE marks are covered, need, are required to have a UKCA mark from the, from the 1st of January. UKCA will not be recognised in the European Union. If you sell goods both in the UK and EU, you're going to have to have two lots of certification. There's a separate mark for Northern Ireland. Remember the, the difference? They were left by in the customs union, whereas the, the, the rest of Great Britain are out. So um, the, there, there is a brand new UK Northern Ireland mark coming in for the province. That has to be EU compliant, so that will follow EU rules, but they're also required to carry the CE mark. And the breaking news this morning, um, the uh, HMRC and, and the DTI pulled the, the website advice for uh, the Northern Ireland mark in the light of the agreement that was reached on Thursday night by Michael Gove. Services. This is one of a number of high-level sheets. We've got about a dozen or 15 at this level. Um, I, never mind the detail, just look at the complexity in there for, for service industries. Um, and this is, we go down about another four levels below each of these sheets. Um, the, the headline from that one, 13th of October, uh, we're not ready. Finance, similarly, we're not ready. People, so we do goods, finance, capital, uh, uh, services, and, and people. Whole new set of things coming through, decisions being made day by day. Um, as recently as 20, no, 20, 20, November 2020, um, there, there were new categories put into there. Looks like at about a thousand pounds per annum per migrant worker. That's anybody who isn't UK, and Ireland is accepted. But again, um, it's no, never mind the, the, the detail and let's just grab that complexity. Um, so that's, that, that's very briefly the four categories from a UK government perspective. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of web pages going up. What's happening if you're a, a European One company minute. trading with the UK? Thank you. U European company trading with the UK. No new requirements. It's relatively simple. Um, there are about 70 notices and the UK simply gets added to the third country list um, and they're, con they're continuously going. 
we were originally under the withdrawal agreement we were given grace periods on about 120 items uh, none of those have been renewed since the UK made the decision to move the goalposts to the right breaking news this morning they are, as Ray mentioned they've offered us four grace periods but there's a sting in the tail uh, Northern Ireland uh, the, they are they are covered by the the protocol that hasn't shifted as the rest of the UK, the GB has shifted and we will have a new customs border between GB and Northern Ireland from the 1st of January 2021 and again from a risk perspective a whole new set of reporting uh, systems all of which have got to work seamlessly together in order to move goods between the UK and Northern Ireland and that in 10 minutes is <laughs> <laughs> yes well done Ruthless. John thank you very much <laughs> okay right I'm now going to change presenter again um, and I'm now going to change it to uh, Ragnar Ag Angel Agnel sorry sorry Ragnar and um, here we go right so Ragnar um, Ragnar is a partner at Centigo um, which is an organisation that helps um, European companies and organisations through business critical and cross-functional change projects. Um, his LinkedIn profile, so it must be right, mustn't it, says he's got 25 years of experience in defining and leading change projects from innovation and the idea phase up to the realised benefits, including digital transformations, scale-up of startups, post-M&A integrations, innovation incubation and one-off programmes. So we're going to hear uh, from Ragnar now about the supply chain challenges of Brexit. Um, this is particularly important. IRM, as most people I think will know, has a supply chain risk management certificate um, that is growing in popularity because so many things that have happened over the past year have underlined the importance of getting your supply chain right. So I can see Ragnar's um, uh, presentation here on the screen. So I'll ha now hand over to you, Ragnar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And very, very uh, nice to see so many of you here. Uh, I assume that there's an underlying interest in what uh, supply chain risks and supply chain challenges uh, will be. Um, and uh, since we work quite a lot with supply chain uh, changes, uh, often coming in with a uh, perspective uh, to as problem solvers and, and uh, planning of implementations and also seeing them through. Uh, we, we have worked quite a lot with Brexit uh, in later years, uh, naturally, and it's been an extremely interesting journey and uh, I think we're in for some even more interesting times ahead, um, as you may also uh, understand. Um, I prepared an agenda uh, to presumably meet your needs uh, and interests, and this is how it looks like, and I'll take you through it. Uh, if there's one thing that I would like you to take away from my presentation, would it be brief, uh, is, is this, um, um, and also another motto would perhaps be that uh, there's no time like the present. If you haven't started, uh, the time is certainly now. Uh, also to speak about supply chain consequences or supply chain challenges of Brexit in these days when, when uh, uh, there are ongoing negotiations. Uh, and uh, also I had to apply this motto from uh, Eisenhower here uh, to to be prepared for different scenarios. And one actually uh, would be that we get some news uh, today. Uh, I didn't uh, because uh, I think um, there'd be so much detail anyway. So I don't, I don't wanna take you through my thought process, but uh, I think that could be recommendable for you as we will see. Um, so how will supply chains uh, be impacted uh, uh, by Brexit? This is just skimming on the surface. Uh, we'll repeat a little bit what uh, Ray and John have already said. Uh, so on, on the process chain side here to the left, uh, we'll have the obvious tariffs, customs, VAT, uh, different scenarios for that, uh, tracing, uh, country of origin, etc. And what will those um, changes mean uh, to your organizations uh, to, uh, with regards to competence and capacity and with regards to information needs and how you uh, use systems and the need to use systems going forward? the the picture um, expands and expands quite a lot uh, compared with uh, how you handle it today um, and and uh, mind you that this is actually uh, the external regulatory requirements that we're sort of bullet listing here what you need to do internally in your organizations and in your supply chain is very much up to you and that's what we uh, are sort of good at guiding you at but it's that's that's another 
uh, if this is the tip of the iceberg, uh, you will need to, to uh, build it up with your own competence and your activities and actions. And uh, that's what, uh, uh, for many, uh, lies ahead of you. Uh, okay, uh, another one, another reminder that there is uh, uh, very little time to go. Um, uh, to find out more, I, I said that that was just skimming on the surface, you need to go deeper. Um, and uh, John already showed uh, the, uh, some of the uh, artifacts from the government. Uh, there's a plethora of different requirements. Um, a recommended reading would be uh, the border with the European Union, uh, with uh, lots of process maps and instructions and different stages, uh, of course, from the 1st of January, but also from uh, later uh, milestones uh, for importing in particular. Uh, this is very rich in content. Uh, it was released in October, etc. I don't want to uh, talk at length about it and uh, maybe some, some, um, uh, some advice on as, as to how to, to, to uh, go through it. I would recommend everybody to, to understand your supply chains, to understand uh, this is the new context by which your uh, products uh, and your raw material and your finished goods and the information all around that uh, and the invoicing, etc., and the customs, that, that's, it's an entirely new uh, context. Uh, and um, it, uh, to go through this uh, will just uh, make you perhaps a little bit confused. We can help to, to guide you and to accelerate that learning curve, but you, I would definitely recommend you to, to, uh, to, um, to have an organization which has the, the, the confident knowledge of this. Um, uh, so how could you go about then? Uh, I, I prepared something of a, a very, very generic scenario. Uh, so uh, it may not be entirely applicable to you, but it seems like the average or the median company has prepared a high level risk plan. I think maybe uh, thanks to, to you guys, to our risk managers uh, and in the area of uh, risk analysis and assessments uh, and uh, have not uh, developed any detailed implementation plans uh, sort of uh, applied in a wait and see approach. So this could be an example of what you would need to do if you're that type, or if you fit into that profile. Uh, you would start reassessing using the knowledge that comes out, the severity of your already defined risks, maybe that's what you do on a day or a weekly basis. Identify changes, and there will be pieces coming out uh, actually day by day now, as I think John has exemplified. Mobilize some kind of core team. You could call it a, a war room, a supply chain control tower, or, or um, just a communication hub, because uh, communication will be extremely important, uh, as in all types of, actually COVID-19 has been examples that uh, there may have been some practice for organizations to, to, to uh, focus on the communication side, uh, on, on strategic vendors, on customers, on partners, uh, and, and then practice on it uh, with this core team uh, and the war room, or, or what do you want to call it, uh, to practice what, what scenarios are likely to occur, uh, and how would we uh, call each other up, send emails, how would we transfer data, what would we actually do, can find solutions, uh, and, uh, and um, so typical critical scenarios, of course, uh, in, a, in an order that would make sense and prioritize, because we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, more detail on this. Um, uh, this is just an example of what could be a 100-day or 121-day uh, program, uh, and uh, not only to, to um, identify and assess risks and address those, but also uh, going into exploring some opportunities. Uh, don't want to make uh, this type of project a program and investment only to, to, to sort of fix problems, but also to be resourceful and, and see how this could, could be turned into a competitive advantage for your organization. Um, so um, that turns, uh, that get, leads us a little bit into, uh, well, this was a bit of a negative slide on, have you, if you haven't started at all, this uh, booklet that Stratagem, together with Centigua and other partners, have prepared uh, for the full life cycle of, of uh, going from nothing to, to a successful implementation and preparations of Brexit. But uh, leading into some success factors here, um, you don't want to uh, uh, look at risk management only as addressing risk, but also to explore, uh, identify and explore opportunities. Uh, and that's the mindset that we typically want to apply when we work with any kind of regulatory change um, because it's, uh, it's more motivating uh, and it's, uh, it will actually uh, be easier for you guys who may look at risks all the time to sell it internally in your organizations. Uh, so here we've got some good stuff. Communication and coordination, uh, coordination um, and uh, inter internal communication to build awareness, 
uh, builds that resilience that uh, I think Ray brought up uh, and knowledge of, of whom to contact and when for different issues, uh, as well as a, a clear definition of roles in the whole supply chain. Maybe you have freight forwarders, you have third party logistics providers, you have your vendors, you have second tier vendors, you have customers and you have end customers, uh, all of that. Uh, to understand uh, the, the flow of communication and priorities. I mean, if, if a certain order gets stuck somewhere, uh, is Eight it really minutes. that serious? Okay, uh, and, this, and that would be part of practicing, my second point here, uh, practice the critical scenarios uh, and do so in a virtual environment. Uh, we have done so here at Strategy and Siegel with, with a digital collaboration platform, very, very uh, useful uh, when we're, everybody's working from home because you have to think about all this in the context of working from home in most areas of, of, of the world. Um, and focus on follow-up, performance measures. If you do have problems, you want to know about them immediately and take action immediately. Looking back and knowing that I only have 30 seconds, this is rather, this is rather good, isn't it? If you look at this. Uh, who doesn't want to have close contact and a close dialogue with the customers? Who doesn't want to have a close dialogue with your strategic vendors? Who do, doesn't want to prove that you have a capability internally and with your supply chain to handle critical scenarios and in a situation where everybody's uh, communicating virtually? And who doesn't want to have full transparency and control of your supply chain? So, so all of these that uh, uh, one could say would be critical success factors for you to mitigate the risks are actually extremely good, uh, good um, capabilities that will set your uh, organization up for the future in a, in a stronger and more resilient way. Thank you, that's all I had. Uh, that's great, thank you very much Ragnar. Um, I think you know, supply chains are clearly you know, one of the key areas that um, people are gonna have to look at. Now our last speaker is Pado Duffy. Um, Pado is, uh, is an I, a long-standing IRM member and he's actually the originator of the idea to run this webinar. So thank you very much for that, Pado. Um, with a, a military background, he's a founder director of Soluxa. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and he represents Ireland on ISO's technical committees um, for risk management and also governance of organisations. He's also an active member of a number of IRM groups. Um, what he does on, you know, as a day job, Soluxa um, has actually developed a range of like automated smart risk assessments and they use crowdsourcing and um, data analysis techniques uh, to, for decision support. Um, so uh, Pader is now going to talk to us and he's going to talk about some how, specifically how to find out how the um, Brexit transition process is going to affect his organisation. So I'm going to change presenters to Pader and hopefully Padder's screen will appear. Let's see. There we go. Can you see my screen? We go to full screen. I'm going to move off the slide in a moment. Can you see that slide? Yeah, we can see your slide. You can go Great, to full screen for seeing the whole thing. Well, I'm going to I'm going to go into, I'm going to take a risk and right. move into the live environment in a moment. Oh, right. uh, so. <laughs> um just before I start, I'd like to um John Shuttleworth there, folks, um, has a deep, deep, deep rental understanding of the detail of all of this. And you would have seen the people who are going to take the Brexit uh, risk assessment on Seluxor. There's an option there to download the um, fifth edition of the Brexit ebook that John has, has produced. There'll be, he tells us another two or three editions of that before the end of the year. I'd strongly urge people to go back into your IRM uh, webinar invitation and download that ebook. It's massively important. Clearly, from what we've heard before, the future is not what it's, uh, it used to be. Um, and as a risk manager, I would I, I like using the analogy of the um, two guys in the woods uh, being chased by a bear. You do not have to be faster than the bear, just faster than the other guy. So, what does that mean in practical terms? It all comes down to information, knowing something that the other guy doesn't know, being able to outcompete your 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 competitor. Um, the people that undertook the um, Brexit risk assessment uh, did so on this system here. In about five to seven minutes, I've just pre-filled this here. They selected these values. They responded to these questions. 
They decided if what they had to say was either a risk or an opportunity, and they simply selected values here like this. That's important to understand because that's where the data came from. And at the end of each question, it rolled back to the second question and so forth. So there's an opportunity here, I believe, for the risk profession. We've had the experience that we're living through it now of COVID-19. We're going through Brexit now. And I think there's an opportunity here for chief risk officers and risk managers to pivot from being risk officers to being intelligence officers, being the people that have the most relevant answers to all of the questions. And if we don't have answers to questions, being the people who can provide the most reliable answers to questions more quickly than the next guy. And that's part as well of being faster than the other guy um, in the woods running away from the bear professionally and so forth. So the output data that drives decisions, the kind of information that a board wants to see is something like this, a SWOT. They're not really interested in risk registers. Those on the risk committee are, but at a board level, the main board, they want to get that big picture. So in terms of this big picture here, these are the overall responses from 111. Clearly, big bubble here for, for, for threats. Interestingly and reassuringly, quite a decent sized bubble for opportunities, weaknesses and strengths. This picture changes a little bit when you go from country to country, clearly. Greece sees only threats based on the responses. Ireland has a spread. The UK quite clearly has a spread and so forth. Now, at a very high level, that's as much as your board of directors would want to see. But then they're going to want to say, what kind of threats? And they'll want to know that you can drill down into the detail like I have here in this tooltip. But then also, how do these threats spread across the world and so forth? So here we have a simple pie chart representation of the totality of the observations that people made, 76.32% of the observations they made were identified as risks, smaller percentile opportunity spread across these regions. And on the input data, people were asked to identify what part of the business is going to be affected most. What we found here was that people identified customers and operations at the principal impact areas. But when we looked at the detail, we found that many of the supply chain observations actually were put in the, in the operations box. When you drill down into that, you can see the kind of information that people entered as their particular observation. So we decided that the three questions we were going to put to participants, that they were all mandatory. So the size of the, these three bubbles here are all of the same size. Size. If they were not mandatory, then they would be of different sizes reflecting the particular question that people opted to answer ahead of the others. Here are what you can see. And by the way, just to remind you again, because of what we expect to happen over the weekend, in terms of discussions, we decided to keep this open to the middle of next week. So you can go back into the webinar invitation you received from the IRM and complete this assessment if you haven't done so already. Or indeed, if you want to go back in and change the assessment you've made, you can do that as well. What kind of insights do we get from this? Well, we have the numerical analysis here in terms of a fairly even spread in terms of average ability to demonstrate and the average potential impact across this number of responses here. And again, the analysis here of the number of threats, opportunities and weaknesses. What I found a bit interesting was how these numbers change a little bit. When I select, for example, business unit, people representing business units. 
it changed a bit again as you could appreciate, given the corporate view. But I was interested here that people representing strategic business units had a higher average ability to demonstrate what they were saying and a slightly higher potential impact. Now, what insight does that give us? If this were one organization and that was the kind of data you were getting back, you'd be asking yourself, what can these strategic business units see that corporate cannot see? A representation here of the Brexit impact, impact analysis. If I just take one sample here, notice here the filters we have across the top. Uh, by the way, the data we have here represents about seven or 800 lines um, on an Excel spreadsheet. That's what you're looking at effectively, sliced and diced here. But if I select here business impact, I thought it was interesting that in the biggest, the strongest um, viewpoint was in terms of the average ability to demonstrate and average impacts, that the impacts were substantially going to be financial. I thought that was interesting. Two minutes to go, Pada. Thank you. Here, in terms of the operations dashboard, when asking people who are disparate across countries, towns, regions, geographies, and so forth, um, to respond to a question. There has to be low to no cognitive load. If people have to pause even for a fraction of a second, asking, what do they want to know here? You've lost them. So we find that asking people, what is your ability to demonstrate something? On the drop downs you saw on the input side. And this was the, the range of values that we got from unable to demonstrate, limited, to fully able, and similarly the range of impacts. There's a lot, multiple insights to be gleaned when you uh, dive into this, into this detail. We're risk managers, we'd expect to see a risk register. What I found interesting here was that when I selected observation type, because you'll remember, you might remember, at the very beginning, when a person enters in their observation, they're asked to determine whether or not this relates to an opportunity or to a risk. Interestingly here, five of the things that appear on the risk register relate to opportunities. That is to say, opportunity identified with low to no ability or confidence in the ability to achieve that particular, that particular opportunity. In terms of sentiment, well, the questions were fairly neutral of themselves, and of course, we got back a fairly neutral range of responses. When we look, when we search in terms of text mining for the frequency of words used, not surprisingly, words like Brexit and business, disruption and so forth appear. That's your 10 we minutes, that... Pada. Thank you. Um, I will just conclude on that because we've seen enough, I think. My point that I would reiterate is the opportunity that Carolyn, you know, I'm a very active member in the our innovation SIG in the IRM. I think there is a very significant opportunity for our profession to pivot from being the traditional risk managers to being the chief intelligence officers, the intelligence managers, because all we're using, all we're doing here is using proven and existing technology to do our work that we've been doing um, over the last 10 years, but now to greater effect, shifting from being information gatherers, manually, traditionally, at, low, at high cost, to being people who manage information, provide information, people who are asked to go to all the meetings because we've got the most reliable information to support decision makers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Padda. Right, I'm just gonna go back to Yeah. Right, so I'm now going to look at the questions that we've had coming in. Um, 
we've got some specific questions that we perhaps we can we can start off with um and then we've got some more sort of you know theoretical and uh, opinion based questions that have come in um so we have a question about um uh, the, the sort of timing and, and implementation um can so letty has asked can you still use items with ce marks if purchased before the first of january so I, I don't know who would like to answer that one as john john is going to answer that one yes you can um the the way the regulations were framed when they were issued in september it says that the technically the goods should have been landed in the uk on the first of january i can't see any way that that can possibly be policed we've got so much uh, so much in that 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 our goods in transit at the moment um and and I think the, the 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 risk to individual is incredibly low because we are using the same standards in the UK for certification as we are uh, EU uh, that we're aligned at the moment and it will take time before the, those standards start to drift apart. Um, so I think there's a there's a, a regulatory risk um, and 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 a, and a practical it will be what it will be as as uh, until goods sell out. Okay, thank you, John. Um, we've got another sort of similar sort of question um, about details. Um, if a supplier is based in the UK and the customer is in the EU or vice versa, and they're buying goods and there's a delay due to border delays um, and going to court is not practical in a timely manner, what are your thoughts about the likely way that, we're, that such disputes will be resolved? So is this something new or is there something that you've seen in all the preparations that might help with this anybody have uh, any views on that? yeah i'll answer that um so it's very hard to um offer an excuse of or the fence of contract frustration uh under brexit that's the first thing i would say and that there will be organizations which will be disadvantaged and some will have opportunities out of it but it, you will not be able to win that case in court. So it's not, you will not be able to fight it. Uh, there are rules under the uh, Rome Convention where you can take things to a higher court, but it doesn't actually apply to here. So the only way you're gonna do it is by some form of arbitration, but you have to remember you are legally bound by your contract. Uh, you will find that a lot of organizations actually trade without contracts. Um, and you're gonna have a, a negotiation issue there. And what we're finding is that um, the key thing organizations haven't done is they haven't actually looked at the margin implications of this. So the cost, pricing, et cetera, associated with, the, with these. And there are very, and when organizations begin to work out the margin differential, um, we see a huge divergence between what say a UK firm and maybe an Irish firm would have, have calculated. I've seen an order of between sort of 50,000 and 5 million in one case where we had to intervene or we had to help an organization to work it out it was actually the five million case and it showed it illustrates that you need to understand the contract but also the detail around tariffs and all sorts of other processes that are required it's not an easy issue to address it isn't and, and to, to to ray's point so this is a yes and uh up until now it hasn't mattered because whether whether our contract was set, said it will be solved in Irish law or English law or any European law ultimately the Supreme Court uh, the European Court of, of Justice EUCJ was the, the final arbiter and, and everybody came under that now it matters and if you think of this the sticking points this is one of those three sticking points how are things you remember uh, governance is is one of the three stick points and it's precise at this point on contracts that's a great question and 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 we won't really know in, until we start to see some case law starting to come through in the new year can i jump in here also to to i don't know the context or, or the product or, or the relationships but uh, this is how my my thought or reflection would be to try to solve the problem uh, you have a customer probably behind this uh, and try to solve the customer first before going to court. And this is why communication, proactive communication uh, is so important. Uh, I'm probably generalizing a lot now and I don't know the, specific, the specifics of the case, but 
but to be proactive with regards to communication, have a good relationship and try to improve relationships uh, during this very, very difficult uh, period. But if you have a contract that, that says you're doing, going to deliver at a certain landed price uh, and then tariffs are going to be applied to that product or goods, then, um, then that's where we're, we're off into unknown territory. This is cliff edge stuff. Yeah, and I, I see an example of this with a well-known Scottish shortbread manufacturer where with their uh, customers, they worked out what the pricing implications were. They had to redesign their supply chain and source butter from Northern Ireland rather than Southern Ireland. And then they worked out what the price impact was, was 5%. So they decided, well, we won't apply the 5%, but between the two parties, the EU party and the UK party, the, the manufacturer, we will both take 50% of that 5%. So we would share the negative impact of this to keep the market. But it, matter, it matters if it's a 40% tariff, such as it could be applied to lamb from the 1st of January. And that's why they'd move the supply, the, uh, some of the commodity elements. Sort of. mm. yeah. yeah. Thanks, Holden. Then we've got a question from, from Adrian. <clears throat> um, it's about really the, the um, preparation by other other companies and other other countries outside the UK and Ireland. And Adrian says, um, if I'm in a company in Germany or France, etc., and I happen to know that Adrian is, uh, he's, he's, he's in Europe, then how do they know what they have to do? Is there a similar process going on in all the European countries that um, are similar um, questions and, and problems? Yeah, there, there is. What you have is each of the governments will have prepared their own guidance on it and there will be training courses and you find that various governments have actually uh, issued grants to help organisations find new customer supply chains, we're involved in innovation programmes and all sorts of stuff. So there's a lot of aid from governments. The issue is if you're outside of the European Union and say for example you're an Indian company who's using UK to get into the, uh, into the European market, and there's no trade agreement between the UK and India, uh, or indeed between India and, and the European Union, you are in trouble. So, you know, it's a bigger issue. It's, it's, it's about really understanding the WTO, how it works, and understanding the existing free trade agreements that the European Union has that the UK will no longer be able to avail of until it negotiates its own. As, as, of, as of this morning, the UK has rolled over. So we the claims of Brexit of, of being a bright new future, we've rolled over 23 of the, uh, the, the, the 41 European Union trade deals. Um, as Ray, Ray mentioned earlier, the only deal that hasn't been a mirror image of what, it, what currently exists under the EU is Japan. And that was a very, very marginal shift um, in, in, indeed absolutely minimal. Um, the number of countries uh, Singapore signed yesterday, uh, the number of countries is going up. Um, whether, we'll, whether we'll get to the 41, um, I, I, I don't know. So pr presently we, we have, as we go into the 1st of January, right now, those 23 trade deals, some of them are multiples like in, in, uh, in different parts of the world, that covers 52 of the 160 nations in the World Trade Organization. Okay. Sorry to be nerdy, nerdy about it, but it's really yeah. important if you happen to be trading with, with, with one of those countries. If that, if, and if that's your sole um, supply, supply chain, then it's damn important. Yeah. Moving on, um, we've talked about um, actual physical movements of goods and things, but um, we have a question from Divya about what will Brexit's impact be on the insurance sector? Um, all the different lines, freedom of services, regular, regular insurance. Um, I think you mentioned financial services. Um, a lot of people within IRM um, are very close to the insurance sector. So do we have some observations on the impact on the insurance sector? Yeah, um, it's interesting that there are around about um, 30 UK insurers who trade into the European market. And obviously what they got, they've done is they've had to set up, uh, many of them, uh, operations in uh, European Union countries. Um, and there are around 750 European Union insurers who trade into the UK market. And uh, they have to do the same. The fact is, actually, not all of them have done it. 
So there's going to be an issue in terms of uh, availability and coverage of product. Uh, everybody knows that the World Trade uh, rules uh, don't cover the uh, supply of services, uh, and that will have particular regul regulatory implications. We have been doing some work with the uh, our discussion. We had some events with the Lloyd's Market uh, organization or association, and also we work very closely with the regulators. And we are seeing that some of the interpretation of regulation made by the insurance companies have been challenged uh, and they're having to rework it. So uh, there are some quite significant contractual valuation uh, and regulatory issues that are there that need to be addressed. But fundamentally, you know, you need to be able to uh, manufacture and supply within the European Union to the European Union. Okay, now we have a couple of questions that have come through about GDPR. Um, yep. What does a no deal Brexit mean for GDPR? Um, you know, what, so what does a, a Brexit with a deal mean for GDPR? Who, who's the GDPR? You're, you're all sort of <laughs> about to get started, so it's obviously something yeah, that you're thinking there's, about. There's no difference. There's no difference. You're messed. You really have, you have a GDPR issue irrespective. It's interesting. My wife works for a, a small insurance company or brokerage, uh, and uh, they had to. Uh, a contact around 50 of their main providers this week to make sure that they were GDPR compliant. A lot of the audits and assessments we did on behalf of clients in the run up to the original March uh, 2019 date were actually around GDPR. Um, and the, there are differences between transfer of data from the UK to the European Union uh, and vice versa in terms of requirements. And there's issues around processing, but the European Union have and the UK government have provided very clear guidelines on what's required, and um, they're actually pretty straightforward to follow. You know, it's not a it's not a minefield, but you need to address it. John, do you have anything to add to that? No, that that's that's very uh, very precise. Okay, um, we have comment uh, a question about um, virtual goods and services, so things like software as a service. Um, is there any observations about how uh, that's going to be impacted? It's very similar to the GDPR is issues. Um, te te technically, it shouldn't happen. So mm. uh, there was a, a, a case mentioned recently um, on, on storage of data, but, but we cannot we cannot, if, if there were an, an IT team was uh, supporting a, a European bank, um, the only place that, they, that, that that will be able to legally happen from in the United Kingdom is Northern Ireland, again, because of the differentiation of, 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 uh, of the time. Technically, IT teams should not be supporting systems that are resident in Europe from, the, from Great Britain. And I could add that uh, if this is software that is combined with a physical product uh, and the end use is, is uh, in an area that needs to be controlled, like military end use, then there, there, there could be a difference to it. But we probably need to look into to what the type of yeah. product with the software has. Then. Yeah, but if, but if you're not storing data, if you're just selling software, it, the process is still the same as selling software internationally. There's no change. But is it there's a service? Yes, sorry, my, my, my answer was specific to support. Yes, support, yeah. Okay. Um, now, when we sent out the, um, the invitations for this webinar, um, somebody on our contact list uh, was sufficiently moved to, to call up the IRM office and complain that the tone of the invitation was very negative um, and oh. that everything was going to be great. Um, <laughs> and, and they hoped that we were going to give sufficient airtime to, to that side of things. So um, we we did note in the uh, the presentation that you made, Padder, that um, that people are seeing opportunities in there. Um, would you would everybody like to comment a bit uh, about the opportunity side of of the um, months and the years that we see before us? So if we, should we start off with Ray? A few words on opportunity. Yeah, well, the first thing is they, uh, any negative impact on the economy is going to be offset initially by an increase in services. 
because uh, you will need services to address the issues. So whether they're technology services or any support services, they're going to increase. Um, we, we saw initially sort of the, you know, the, the sellout of storage facilities and whatever else. Um, UK government policy and UK strategy is really quite important, whether it's re regional or whether it's uh, uh, nationwide. Um, and we've seen um, quite a lot of industries who are going to benefit from this. As I mentioned in my, 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 talk, my part of the talk, for example, life sciences, uh, technology. The UK has a very developed plan on what's going to happen. Uh, it's going to support uh, the movement of people. Uh, it's got very specific investment plans for particular sectors, particular types of development. Um, and they are very large opportunities uh, for organizations. Uh, you know, you have to think, I mean, the example of, you know, Singapore in the North Sea was used in the early days. That still is very much an example, but this goes back to its ability to have play a level playing field and regulation. So, you know, if the UK was uh, able to um, diverge sufficiently to create competitive advantage, um, there would be huge opportunities because, you know, price and market would flow there. Um, and I think that's what the UK thought it would have. But there are undoubtedly opportunities. I would, we, I would just add that. Can we go to Pada next? Um, and and Pada, we just had a little supplemental question there about some um, opportunities for Northern Ireland. So perhaps you'd like to cover opportunities with a view to um, also to Northern Ireland. Okay. Well, if I cover both in terms of of a general answer, um, people, the opportunities for different companies would be different for those companies because they're all in different sectors. They're all of different scale. They've got different customers. They've got different suppliers. So, to the I think excellent example that Ray gave earlier on to the the, um, the biscuit manufacturer in Scotland, what they did, I would say in the context of opportunity, that every organisation just needs to really violently reimagine the world that we're now living in, and reimagine relationships. Um, I'm minded of the story when. Henry Ford started to really impact on um, the production of cars in the States. And um, for the people who made the buggy whips, remember those? If you had a horse and a cart, you had a buggy whip. Um, most of them said, we are finished. The car is coming. No more horses, no more um, buggies. But some said, those cars will require leather seats. So instead of producing buggy whips, they moved into making uh, manufacturing seats that were supplied to Henry Ford. So this is the whole idea in the context of collaborating with others you know, across the country, across geographies. We're living in a very, very small digital world. So it's for you within your own organization to reimagine everything, network, and find a way of collaborating in real time. The day of risk managers producing PDFs and PowerPoints are over. Things are moving too quickly. We want real-time, actionable, data-driven information and collaborate with people online using the likes of these technology you've seen here or those that Ragnar made reference to earlier on. Ragnar, opportunities? Uh, I thought it was rather upbeat, actually, in my presentation. Uh, that, uh, of course, all changes are... Uh, are difficult, uh, but if you look at uh, adversity and difficulties as as a problem in a negative way, then then you will have them. Uh, I think um, looking back a year, there was uh, so so the economy, and then we got uh, the pandemic, and now we have possibly, uh, 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 depending on how you look at it, of course, uh, 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 different types of impacts depending on, on on the outcome of the negotiation. But all of this is an opportunity to 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 apply. Uh, leadership uh, and uh, a culture to 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 grow that um, resilience muscle uh, and to to actually install very very good habits. Uh, now that we're working virtually, there are opportunities in that. Uh, and uh, if you come out of this stronger, look at opportunities and not only at risks. I think uh, Peter uh, referred to very much. Also, uh, well, also in particular in this profession uh, uh, with IRM, uh, then I think there's a lot of opportunity to to uh, to look at, but it's it's very much a mindset and a leadership question. And I think not only we, look, we shouldn't necessarily look at the the PM or the Queen or whatever, 
uh, look at your organization, look at your group, look at your team. Um, that's, I think, uh, how this group, when, we're, when we come in as advisors and consultants, it's usually not because things are, are hunky-dory. <laughs> we usually come in to solve problems. And part of the problem solving is actually about that. Uh, uh, John, um, I mean, Clive has sent in a, a comment that about there's going to be a huge opportunity for tax avoidance um, in terms of uh, free ports. <laughs> Would you like to comment uh, we, more? We, we, yes, um, uh, uh, over the years we've looked at tax avoidance, we've looked at smuggling, we've looked at counterfeiting. Um, so, so uh, yes, there'll be hu hu there will be huge opportunities there. Um, in, 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 in the, in, <laughs> and, and, and we need to be ready for it and to deal with it. Look what happened uh, with, with, with COVID and, and the false claims that came in um, for, for, for people on furlough that didn't exist. Um, so um, I think we're, we're going to have a real shock. I think um, the, the, what, what, what is a surprise to, to people that, 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 like myself, that have spent two to three years really getting in the detail of this is how unaware the gen general public is. I mean, the shock on the BBC who are running an item today uh, on the fact that, that, that um, we may not be just able to go to, the, to Europe as tourists from the 1st of January, as we've done for the last 40 years. So um, th there is undoubtedly going to be a shock. Uh, if we can, as a nation, do a leapfrog, and, and that's to, to Padder's point. Um, we, 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 we will need we, to, to rebuild. I think, for example, I'm enormously optimistic about the, the agriculture bill um, as, as we shift away to the future and linking that into building a better environment future. If we can do leapfrogs in those areas, then that's where the opportunities will come. Um, economically, I think it will take, I, I've heard various estimates, I think it will take between five to 10 years before we find our feet and, and come through it. I've heard some economists who are talking as long as 30 years. Um, the optimist in me says uh, five to 10, I'd like to see it in my lifetime. <laughs> okay, we have two minutes left. Um, I'm gonna ask each of the panelists. It's all right, laughing right. <laughs> one sentence of advice for the risk managers listening about you know, what they should be doing, what they should be thinking about uh, over the coming months. Uh, so one sentence of advice from each of you. Ray? I would say they need to do a, uh, a connected risk review of, uh, of this. Don't look at Brexit on its own. Look at, look at the implications of COVID and uh, all the other risks that are, because they're all, they're all mixed together. Just don't look at Brexit on its own. Ragnar? Um, I would say um, if you haven't detailed your implementation plans, if you haven't sort of practiced the scenarios, uh, start doing that and, and be pushy, but also be positive in, internally in your organizations. Uh, uh, if it's, the decision is not down to you, try to be a force for, for something constructive and positive. John? Get that 100 day war room up and running and manned uh, and be, re be ready to do the firefighting for the first 100 days, get through that and then build for the future. And the final word to Pada. So there's a massive opportunity here for risk managers to do one thing and that is to increase our relevance to decision makers. And that is done by not getting caught in the woods for the trees. What is a risk? It's simply anything that can stop us or slow us down towards achieving our objectives. Focus on the objectives and help folk to work out what really matters in terms of what can stop us or slow us down, what we have to do to break down the silos with partners and suppliers to get a new reimagined organization together. Ragnar is so right and John is so right. It's about mindset. Great opportunity for our profession. Thank you very much. So well, we're nearly finished now. Um, I'd just like to say thank you to everybody. I'd like to say thank you to all our speakers for putting such a, a, a very rich and detailed um, set of presentations together. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the audience as well. We've had a, questions pouring in and sadly I'm very sorry if we haven't managed to get around to your particular question. It's obviously something people feel, uh, you know, that, that they have a lot of things they need to know. Um, you can download the presentations uh, from either through the webinar software or if you wait for a follow-up email from, from us, there'll be a link there. Please do complete the survey um, if you haven't done so already. 
uh, and then say somebody might get a chance to, to, to speak at more length to our presenters here today. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Rory and Juliet from our membership team behind the scenes who have um, done a lot of the organising uh, for this and sent out the various emails and so on. So thanks to everybody. And, uh, and, and Carolyn, sorry, yeah. just, you might remember, just remember whoever participates in the assessment, one would be picked, they'll get the free consulting yeah. from the guys mm -hmm. here and the use of the software as well. So, Sorry. and limitless in that regard. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you to everyone and uh, best wishes for the coming holiday <laughs> season. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you at another IRM event soon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.